morning. Thank you, Marcus and Marchand, for having us. As I said, my name is Jennifer Preddy. This is going to be a lecture on reviewing transesophageal echocardiography and lung transplantation. Um, next slide. All right, I have no disclosures to report. Next slide. So lung transplantation is the definitive treatment for end-stage lung disease. TE is an important diagnostic and imaging tool during a lung transplantation procedure and in the post-operative period in the ICU. Uh, TE can be used to assess and diagnose causes of hemodynamic instability, hypovolemia, ischemic changes, progressive RV dysfunction, RV failure, and tamponade, especially in the case of uh, you know, hyperinflation in, in a severe COPD. The surgery is complex, involving vascular anastomoses shown here on the screen of the recipient's and donor pulmonary arteries, as well as anastomosis of the recipient's left atrium to the donor pulmonary vein cuff. These delicate anastomoses are critical to the survival of the lung allograft, both during and after lung transplantation surgery. Pulmonary cuff dysfunction from pulmonary vein obstruction, stenosis, or thrombosis is uncommon, but a serious complication after lung transplant. Uh, the patency of the pulmonary cuff and anastomoses are important because blockages can cause allograft dysfunction and potentially something more serious like hemorrhagic infarction of the pulmonary lobes. The prevalence of pulmonary vein stenosis and thrombosis in a 2019 study were reported at 1.4% and 2.5% respectively. Uh, while that prevalence is low, uh, pulmonary cuff dysfunction can be catastrophic and ultimately cause things like graft failure, stroke, and death. Um, the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists both recommend TE management of, patient, of patients undergoing a lung transplant, uh, especially for the management of hemodynamic instability and the pulmonary vascular anastomoses. Next slide, please. Pre-transplant TE assessment should be done as significant changes occur from the time of transplant evaluation to the date of transplant surgery. There can't be a delay in time there. Uh, things that should be assessed are the RV size and function, uh, assess for dilation of the RV, systolic dysfunctioning, uh, measure another TAPSI, um, RV, uh, which should be noted for presence of hypertrophy. Uh, Tricuspid regurgitation, the severity should be measured. Uh, these measurements predict difficulty tolerating the hemodynamic swings in lung transplant without the use of ECMO or dictate potentially requiring ECMO both during the surgery and postoperatively. Signs of RV pressure overload and high PA pressures are going to be left for bowing of the interatrial septum, systolic flattening of the interventricular septum. Uh, there could be RV hypertrophy, specifically here of the free wall measures greater than five millimeters. Um, a PFO or an ASD in the setting of RV pressure overload could cause a right to left shunt and therefore paradoxical embolism, stroke, or hypoxemia. Not all PFOs require closure, but hypoxemia due to a shunt will likely need to be addressed. Um, an ASD with left to right flow could cause increased blood flow to newly implanted lungs and therefore also contribute to graft failure or dysfunction. Um, a PFO or ASD may require surgical closure during the lung transplant itself or postoperatively when the patient is more stable of percutaneous closure. Uh, of course, a baseline imaging of all four pulmonary arteries, uh, pulmonary veins should be done to provide a basis for comparison for post lung transplant anastomoses. Um, ideally, you also get a visualization and measurement of the pulmonary arteries. Um, of course, the left main stem bronchus makes the left pulmonary artery very difficult to see. Next slide, please. So intraoperative TE assessment, the RV function should be continually assessed during lung transplant. The PA cross clamp and associated increase in afterload may worsen pulmonary hypertension and cause RV failure or worsen the RV dysfunction. Uh, RV failure is gonna present uh, typically with a small LV and a dilated RV. And as the RV enlarges, the intraventricular septum will flatten and shift towards the LV as you see in these images here on the screen. Um, this will happen in both systole and diastole pressure and volume overload respectively. Uh, Pre-existing RV hypertrophy uh, may help maintain some contractility and those cardiac output despite a cross clamp. So it's also something to consider. 
PE can assess the response to inotropic support, inhaled nitric oxide, and volume. Patients often become hypovolemic in the setting of a restrictive fluid strategy and the chest is wide open. So the TE is nice to have uh, to help guide fluid management in those cases. Again, if there is a pre-existing PFO or ASD with left to right flow, the cross clamp can cause a reversal of that shunt. So causing a worsening hypoxemia. So TE should be used to evaluate the interatrial septum and worsening tricuspid regurgitation if you have if you had it to begin with. Once the clamp on the pulmonary vein left atrium has been released, you will see some micro bubbles um, in the left atrium and left ventricle, which these can of course cause some regional wall motion abnormalities that should be temporary. Ongoing bubbles are concerning for an air embolism on the left side of the heart and should prompt inspection of the bronchial nesmosis for a leak. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see uh, the normal pulmonary vein anastomosis measurements that you that this is what it should look like. Uh, the systolic wave is caused by an anterograde ventricular systolic flow and is seen above the baseline. The normal velocity is something uh, between 30 and 80 centimeters per second. And S wave has two components. Uh, S1 is due to atrial relaxation that is determined by left atrial pressure, contraction, and relaxation. And S2 is due to mitral annular descent and impacted uh, by stroke volume, pulse wave propagation in the pulmonary artery tree. The diastolic wave that you see here, again above the baseline, is caused by an anterograde ventricular diastolic flow. And the velocity here should ideally be between 20 and 70 centimeters per second. Uh, the atrial systolic reversal wave uh, that's caused by a retrograde atrial systolic flow and that should be below the baseline, ideally. The velocity here is about 10 to 25 centimeters per second. And of course, under normal circumstances, S will be greater than D. Uh, clinically significant symptoms of pulmonary cuff dysfunction occur uh, when velocities typically are greater than 100 to 150 centimeters per second, and with a pulmonary vein diameter of less than 0.5 centimeters. So here you see nice laminar flow in the top screen and the ideal waveform here in the bottom screen of the Doppler. Uh, next slide, please. Here, uh, put a part of the post-transplant TE assessment. Uh, after the lung allograft has been implanted, TE should be used to assess the pulmonary veins and pulmonary artery anastomoses. Patients that are higher risk complications typically are the smaller patients, patients with a contracted chest, fibrotic lung disease, um, you know, their thoracic cavity is a lot smaller. Uh, why do we care about an obstructive pulmonary vein? It causes hypoxia, it causes pulmonary edema, can, help, can contribute to graft failure, and if there is a thrombus, it can cause a stroke and ultimately patient demise. Uh, causes of an obstructive pulmonary vein, uh, you think of thrombus, a suture itself can cause an obstruction, kinking or external compression, maybe by an oversized lung. Uh, velocity of greater than 100 centimeters per second, turbulent flow or lack of systolic flow predominance can suggest pulmonary vein obstruction. Uh, high velocity can also be caused by contralateral PA and asthmatic narrowing, venous constriction in the donor lung or high blood volume flowing through the lungs. So it's not entirely straightforward. There are a lot of factors to contribute uh, or to consider. Low velocity could be secondary to flow obstruction or low blood volume uh, flowing through the lung because of hypovolemia or cardiac dysfunction. Uh, so you really have to take in the entire, uh, the entire picture. Um, significant stenosis can be suspected, again, if a pulmonary vein is less, diameter is less than 0.5 centimeters. Uh, but if you see a diameter of less than 0.25 centimeters for a freshly anastomosed pulmonary vein, that is more predictive of a graft failure. Uh, but, you know, do note most of the lung transplants, uh, we do our double lung transplant. But if you do have a single lung transplant, high pulmonary velocities, uh, pulmonary vein velocities and the transplanted lung are expected because it has lower pulmonary vascular resistance compared to the native lung. So you will see higher flows. Um, ideally, the PA and osmosis should be interrogated. Of course, they are often too distal to visualize adequately. Um, the PA and, PA and osmosis is considered normal if its diameter is at least 75% of the proximal PA. 
and the flow is non-turbulent. So here on the screen, uh, on the left here, you see the color flow Doppler showing that aliasing of the right upper pulmonary vein. So that looks like there's turbulent flow there. Uh, the middle, you see the Doppler, uh, again, of the pulmonary vein. There's elevated velocities around 160 to 180 centimeters per second. And there's not uh, that defined basic flow that we saw earlier. So this is suggest suggestive of an obstruction. And here on the right is you have a video of the turbulent flow through, through a pulmonary vein. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, again, you see some images of the color flow Doppler with King's pulmonary anastomosis. Again, you see that turbulent flow. Um, and then on the right, again, the pulse wave Doppler with the high, uh, high velocities. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we'll go through some cases. Uh, case one is a 36-year-old gentleman who presents for a double lung transplant. Uh, from home with a history of cystic fibrosis. This is first transplant. Uh, aside from the FBV1 of 20% predicted, he doesn't have any other comorbidities. He has, and is, specifically, has no history of thromboembolic disease. Next slide, please. Uh, the intraoperative, of course, uh, starts off well. There's induction of fentanyl, propofol, and rocuronium. Um, it's unremarkable. Norepinephrine is going through the entire case. Antifibrinolytic therapy here was not used, and heparin was given both before the clamping of the right hyalur structures and the left hyalur structures. The right lung is transplanted first. Uh, it, it goes without complication. Next slide, please. So after reperfusion of the left lung, T assessment of the pulmonary veins uh, anastomoses is done. Um, here you see in the image, this long, uh, very uh, thin mobile echogenic structure that's arising from the left pulmonary vein. Um, it's very long, very skinny. Uh, flow doesn't appear to be limited out of the pulmonary vein in this case. And the vitals remain stable. The PA pressures don't go up. Lung compliance remains stable. And he, the patient is setting 100% on FI to 60%. So this is pretty good. Uh, next slide. The surgeon in this case was able to remove the thrombus without using a bypass. So he did an atriotomy and suctioned out the clot. There was, per the surgeon, there was no structural issues at the anastomosis between the pulmonary veins and left atrium. And repeat TE inspection of the veins showed uh, an unremarkable anastomosis, no thrombus, um, no elevated or, or increased uh, flows. Uh, no protamine was administered in this case. Next slide. So the patient was transferred to the ICU intubated. He did really well. The lung function remained uh, stable and he was extubated that day. The next day, uh, subcutaneous heparin was started and uh, two weeks later, the patient was able to be discharged and they did not give him any further anticoagulation. Next slide, please. This is a different case. This is a patient um, who's 58. He has a known history of pulmonary venous occlusive disease. He's admitted to the ICU uh, with a, a, a acute decompensation, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, and progressive RV failure. Uh, the patient was intubated, uh, and the RV was supported with inotropes, but ultimately he required a VV ECMO in the ICU. And two days later, he was, uh, he was uh, sent to the OR for a double lung transplant. Uh, next slide. So the intraoperative course here, uh, there's uneventful induction. BV ECMO is reconfigured to be a ECMO. Uh, TE showed a dilated RV, not shown here, uh, with reduced function and moderate tricuspid regurgitation. The initial assessment of the pulmonary veins showed blunted, but phasic still, systolic flow and velocities of less than um, 80 centimeters per second. Which is, which is okay given the history. After the lungs were implanted and the patient was separated from ECMO, um, increased velocities were noted in the right upper pulmonary vein um, that you see here with the turbulent flow. Um, the velocities were approaching 180 centimeters per second. And again, uh, the, no phase flow here. Uh, next slide, please. So the donor uh, of note was 13 centimeters taller than the recipient. Uh, lung inflation was thought to be the cause of uh, some external tension and causing the kinking of the pulmonary veins, causing obstructive flow. 
So ultimately the surgeon performed a middle lobectomy and a left lingulectomy and improved velocities were seen on TE inspection of the pulmonary veins. The waveform on spectral Doppler returned to his baseline with more phasic flow and the velocities while still elevated, they dropped from around 180 to less than 120 centimeters per second as seen here. Uh, next slide, please. So both lungs should be uh, transplanted before interrogating the pulmonary veins. Assessment of the pulmonary veins after the first lung transplant, um, sorry, after the first lung is implanted will show high velocities due to the clamp on the contralateral pulmonary artery. Additionally, contralateral pulmonary artery stenosis can lead to increased velocities in the pulmonary veins. In the setting of presser or inotropic use intraoperatively, the hyperdynamic cardiac function, the increased cardiac output, these can all cause an increased pulmonary vein velocity. So something to consider when you're measure taking these measurements. Uh, when a patient is undergoing a single lung transplant, as I mentioned before, the pulmonary venous velocities can be elevated in the freshly implanted lung because of the decreased pulmonary vascular resistance compared to the native lung that's still in the chest. Uh, next slide, please. Data suggests that pulmonary cuff dysfunction is associated with a high mortality. Um, risk of mortality can be mediated by prompt diagnosis and intervention in patients with pulmonary cuff dysfunction. Um, TE during lung transplant surgery is instrumental in diagnosing pulmonary vein pathology. Um, discussion that should be had with the surgeon regarding the risk and benefit of a repair intraoperatively. If the anastomosis was technically difficult, a repair may not improve the outcomes. It's important to know again that hemodynamic measurements made of these anastomoses of the pulmonary veins is affected by, <coughs> excuse me, is affected by cardiac function, ECMO, and cardiac valve pathology even. Um, symptoms of pulmonary cuff dysfunction are similar to those of primary gaps dysfunction. So to me, dyspnea, hypoxemia, pulmonary edema, and hypotension. So pulmonary venous obstruction could potentially be the cause of primary graft failure. Um, in a patient presenting with primary graft dysfunction postoperatively, the pulmonary cuff should be evaluated as a prompt treatment, if possible, may prevent graft failure. These chest x-rays are from a patient who had a left single lung transplant um, and they found a pulmonary vein stenosis that was diagnosed several days later in the ICU. And that's the x-ray on the left here. You see a white out of the left lung. Um, the x-ray on the right is after the patient was taken for a percutaneous stent to relieve the, the stenosis, which we can see the immediate improvement in the chest x-ray. Um, next slide, please. Here's a more systematic approach to TE assessment during lung transplantation. Pre-transplant, you know, you want to look at the right ventricle, the RV size, is it dilated, is there hypertrophy, check out the overall function. Uh, the pulmonary veins, you really want to get a baseline diameter and velocity if you can. Um, the tricuspid valve, if there is regurgitation, you want to take note of its severity. Um, you, do, you want your, your PA uh, uh, measurements as well, um, if there's pulmonary hypertension, uh, that usually comes from the swan, but you can also use the echo. Um, for the pulmonary artery, ideal to get a baseline diameter and velocity if you can, if you can see the two, um, the two arteries. Uh, and obviously for the left ventricle, you want the left ventricle size and function as a baseline. And if you're on ECMO, just confirm the line, line placement. Um, intraoperatively, the ongoing assessment should happen right after induction. Um, when you're on one lung ventilation, when there's a lot of surgical manipulation, um, Clamp, when you're clamping the PA, that's also a critical part. Um, when there's reperfusion of both lungs, and uh, again, when the chest is closed, because that's another source of external compression on the anastomoses. Um, Post transplant, again, you want to confirm your RV function uh, if there's adequate preload, if there's any air coming in. Uh, the pulmonary veins, you're again, you're looking for thrombus, you're looking for a canker stenosis. You want to assess the size and the velocity through each of the veins. And again, you're, you're watching your pulmonary hypertension throughout the entire case and at the end here. Uh, for the pulmonary artery, you know, this also can have a thrombus, a canker stenosis, 
and uh, you know you have to make your best effort to uh, assess the size and, and at least the flow. Uh, the left ventricle again contractility if you have adequate preload if there is any ongoing air um, this is the time to find it and discuss with the surgeon um, about potential options to fix or inspect why it's happening. If you happen to go on cardiac bypass, then you want to check for aortic dissection in your um, insertion sites and check for cardiac tamponade. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are my sources. Next slide. Thank you.